So what can we learn as leaders of business from the conductor of a symphony orchestra? There's a really interesting opportunity to enhance and develop our leadership by learning to lead with deeper listening skills. The conductor listens for something and elicits a whole other level of performance from his team. And that's what this show is all about. We'll be talking with a symphony conductor about his experience of taking business leaders through the experience of being in a symphony and being led by the conductor in different ways and what they can learn about themselves and their own blind spots. Hello and welcome again to the Scaling Up Business Podcast. I'm your host and scaling coach, Bill Gallagher. On the show with me today is an unusual guest, a man with a musical background, a symphony conductor, who uh, has a uh, surprising message for business leadership. Um, his book is Maestro Leading by Listening. I want to welcome Roger Nirenberg to the show. Welcome, Roger. Hi, Bill. How are you? I'm good. Where are you today? New York City. Oh, in New York, and I'm in Los Angeles, so we're on the two coasts. I normally live in San Francisco, but I'm down here because the air is so bad in San Francisco, so we came down to spend a week uh, down in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad to get you on the show. Your book topic and uh, was interesting to me, Maestro, Leading by Listening, as is your background, a little atypical of some of the things we talk about. So talk to us about you know, how your career gets started. You said you were a symphony conductor. Tell us a little bit about the, the arc of that. Uh, career. Yeah, well, uh, my whole career, I was a, I was an orchestra conductor. That was what I did. I was the music director for two orchestras, and I guess conducted in many places around the country and, and eventually around the world. Um, and I thought that was all I was ever going to do. But uh, in the 1990s, the mid-1990s, while I was kind of scratching my head about about how can you build or can you build? Hang on, hang on one second. What, you know, it just occurs to me. I know you're going to tell that story in just one second, but what does the conductor do? I know that on one level, like a little kid thinks he just stands there and uh, waves the baton, but talk to us about what does that, what does that actually mean? Well, the little kid is right that you stand there and you wave the baton, but the thing is, what does the baton mean? Uh-huh. Uh, so basically what you do is you're, in, you're charged with m making the whole thing, the whole musical piece with all these different parts, making it coherent, finding the, the message behind it so that all those, all those musicians can buy into that message and can take it on as their own in the same way that a, a director who's, let's say, directing Hamlet, which could go many different ways, he has an interpretation. And then all the lines that are spoken are some way informed by that interpretation. So your job mostly is to have a success picture for what the, the piece of music could mean and how it could relate to people. And then to, to work with the people, your musicians, in order to get them to realize that vision. And all that is translated by these simple movements of the baton, which means that you have to be able to take big messages and simplify them to such a degree that you're able to convey them with the simplest kinds of means. Mm. I think as you go through the rest of it, we'll uh, continue to hear the parallels to running a business, right? <laughs> to orchestrating the, the cohesive um, work of a team. So to go back to your story in the nineties before I interrupted you. Yeah. So, uh, so I wanted to challenge myself to see if there's a way that I could get the, the people in our population who, who were curious and intelligent, uh, but for whom my kind of music, classical music didn't really play much of a role in their lives. And they felt that it would be perfectly fine to live their lives without without really being exposed to it. My challenge was, was there a way that I could give them a kind of experience that would, would open up their, their hearts to what this music can mean? That was what I wanted to challenge myself with. And, and I thought about it for years. And finally, I invented this kind of learning experience in which I, I kind of stitched together many aspects from my entire career 
and um, and then uh, and then when I launched it, I discovered the reaction was way bigger than I I had anticipated, and especially business audiences. I was getting feedback like this is the best leadership training we've ever had in our lives, or the kind of thing. In two hours, I learned more from you than, than I did in the last twenty years. Those kinds of things they happened a lot. So I began to think that there was something really important here, and I started getting asked by business organizations to present this at their meetings, and then that was when I began to realize the the opportunity that there was. So I just followed the opportunity, and now it 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 even though I consider myself a conductor, this makes up the the largest part of the, the way I spend my time. So what's the experience like? What are you actually doing with people? Well, it's part of a meeting and a business meeting. And uh, there are lots of other things on the agenda generally. But at a certain point, they come into a room. Often the the participants don't know what's going to be in that room. But what they discover is it's set up like a symphony orchestra, except they're sitting inside the symphony orchestra next to the musicians, Um, which is a strange place to find, to, uh, to be, you know, discover yourself. And then the musicians come in, and uh, I get introduced, and then we play a little music. We don't say a single word, and then we play some music. And then I introduce them to, to, to the orchestra and uh, ask them to, c- to conceive of the orchestra as a kind of a, a metaphor for a successful professional organization. But and they're then, literally sitting next to the members of the orchestra facing right. you. You're facing the orchestra, right? right. Exactly. Uh-huh. So you might be sitting next to the bassoonist, or you might be sitting next to a cellist. They're, they're all sprinkled around. And then uh, I begin to – and what's important to know is that I just met the orchestra like an hour and a half before then, spent an hour practicing the music. But the orchestra doesn't know what I'm going to ask them to do. So it's very spontaneous. And then I begin to ask the orchestra to do, to, to do some role-playing exercises. What if this was your mindset? What if this was our culture? Um, what if we behave this way? And they begin to hear the, the relationship between behavior and results. And, you know, that's very difficult to do in real life, but because it's music and it, it connects behavior to results so quickly, it's easy to see. But it turns out that the behaviors I'm choosing are ones that I know from having having uh, consulted with the organization, these are the ones that the whole meeting is about. These deal with the success picture for the organization and also with the challenges and impediments, what stands in their way. And the orchestra is role-playing these various behaviors. So they are getting a very, uh, a very vivid and emotional kind of picture of what kind of organization they could become. And also, of what the behaviors are that that are the pitfalls and they want to avoid and and everybody realizes without being told anything that these things are alive in their organization so the orchestra en- ends up being kind of like a mirror a metaphorical mirror that's being held up to the to the organization in which they can see themselves both as they don't want to be as they are and as they could be and as such, that's a kind of magical and powerful experience to have. Mm. And it's fully experiential, right? It's a, we're just we're we're seeing it, we're living it. We're not talking about it like we are in the show. Well, we're, um, we're reflecting on it. For example, yeah. if, I, if I model a particular kind of leadership behavior, I will likely hand the microphone to one of the musicians and say, "What's it like to work with a leader like that? What was that experience like?" So the musicians talk a lot about about what just happened and what it meant. Uh, the participants, sometimes they speak a little bit, and then afterwards, of course, we talk about it. But you're right that it's it's mostly experiential. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's great music, so it's vivid, it's powerful, it's, it's beautiful, it's stunning, it's impressive, you know. And because a lot of people aren't musicians, they don't really know how to experience music. But I make that I make it very easy for them. I, 
I show them things that are easy for them to understand and easy to grasp. And even the people who walk in with the most cynical attitude, after a little while, they're just completely disarmed because it's so fascinating and it's so, it's so clear that it's unscripted. And then a lot of times it's very funny. Uh, so, it, so it's very appealing. Yeah, I got it. I hear, I hear. Th- so what are the kinds of things? Well, um, so talk to us about what are the lessons from this? Maybe share some of the work that you've done with others. Um, let's take it into the application then. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example of a, a, a client of mine that was a nuclear power plant. Mm. And um, they uh, they had done a lot of improvement and they had, uh, you know, everything in the nuclear and industry is is rated and measured and benchmarked and all that. And they were they were improving a lot on on, you know, uh, elimination of error and uh, and on, you know, getting things to, to function in the right way. But there were certain things that they were their score was not particularly high. And that was on the uh, employee engagement scale. Mm-hmm. And it was because they had this pattern of the senior leaders just making sure that all the junior managers were always coached on what they did and they would be told what to do and how to do it and when to do it and then be they'd be evaluated on it. And that made what it eventually developed was a kind of very passive attitude and people withholding information, even valuable information that they had because they weren't called upon to do it. So that was a way in which this this plant wanted to change its culture, and that was what the music paradigm was about. It was about how the conductor, by being extremely, uh, what would I say, um, just very engaged and always feeling like if he uh, uh, participated in something, that would automatically add value. And then... The, the musicians would talk about how difficult it was working with a conductor like that, how squashed they felt, how, how you know, they didn't feel like they could use their full artistry. And it wasn't just the musicians saying it, but they could hear it uh, because I would do demonstrations, uh, kind of like uh, take on this mindset. Let's say that you you just want to make sure that nobody sees you making any kind of mistake and and uh, you don't want to. You just don't want to do anything that jeopardizes your job. And they hear the orchestra play that way. And then I say, what would it be like if you took whatever risk was necessary in order to make this music come alive? And then they they hear the orchestra open up, and it's the very same music that they just heard a couple of seconds before. But it's so alive, and everybody is stunned by it that the same notes could sound so different. And, and it begins to paint a picture of, is there a way that we could preserve accuracy and, uh, but at the same time liberate this kind of energy and participation? So it conveys the message that they wanted to get across in a much more direct way than if you were to explain the message. And the other thing about the music paradigm is that I never, I never say what anything means. We just do demonstrations. And the participants are left to to figure out whether there's any application, but they all discover it. And because whatever it is that you've discovered, you take much greater ownership than if somebody tells you. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm uh, so I, I love music and I'm, but I'm not well trained in music and, but I, and I definitely uh, when, when you say that I can think of, moments when live performances had all sorts of technical flaws to them. Things would go off, but there was an aliveness and a richness to them um, that wasn't present uh, or is missing in a, you know, a, a, an endlessly produced recording where all of the thing is there, but there's nothing uh, there's nothing dynamic about it. That it's, it could feel a little flat sometimes. Yeah. Well, there's this 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 element of spontaneity, even even in symphonic music, where where the music is is all written down. The notes are going to be the same, but the energy and the the communication of the of the performance is going to be very different. 
Now, we, of course, we in the symphony world, we, we don't really welcome errors. Um, we're not afraid of errors, but we're careful, we're careful to be accurate. But even within that context, there's, there's the release of imagination and creativity, and especially collaboration, the joy of collaboration. But one of, with the nuclear power plant, I showed how, how a leader can kill collaboration and do it in the interest of, of adding value. You think you're adding value, but actually what you're doing is you're killing people's initiative. And uh, that's very audible. As a matter of fact, you can't argue with it because you were sitting there and you saw it happen. Mm, mm, mm. You know, I'm immediately reminded of another experience. I, I very, very briefly served in the military as a young man. And, and you know, when you join most any branch of the military, any place in the world, one of the things that they first do is teach you to, to – uh, to march. So you come in often at night, they shave your head, they take away all your clothes, they put you in a big room with other people, they 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 alter you a bit. And then they make you march, which unless you have some like band practice or something like that, you don't have any particular background. So everybody kind of marches and you find yourself roughly in a line moving in the same direction and all of that. And and on the surface you're all doing what you're supposed to do and yet there's no there's nothing magical about it, but there is a moment when a unit comes together and people do something like that, when all the heel strikes fall together and you have a, an auditory and a physical sense that you are now part of something bigger than yourself where you're working together. And, and the, the difference between a little bit off and together is, is real and vivid in that moment. I remember that like one of the most valuable things of that whole time in the military, much of which kind of sucked, but, <laughs> but that, that moment of like, Oh, this is powerful. And it's like in your body sensation. I would imagine that the music and when the symphony is off versus when the symphony comes together and when everyone is just doing their thing versus everyone is really bringing some uh, passion aliveness that you could feel in the same way. That's right. It's beautifully said what, what you just said. And, and that, of course, that marching is a musical thing. Um, and with the demonstrations that I do, it's not just the question of things being wrong and then being right. I can do a demonstration, for example, in which everything is right, but the, the life is, is, is drained from it because it's done out of obedience rather than inspiration. Um, and you can also have you can have the orchestra model belligerent obedience in which in which they're following the directions but they hate it so much that they're showing how empty the directions are by the way they that they play and that's audible too but there are hundreds of demonstrations that i've, I've evolved after customizing these things for every client because i invent new exercises for each client so that it's customized around the particular goals that they're striving to. Right. And they can feel it. You know, I so as a leader of companies, and I've been CEO a number of times, um, I, I, I know that there are times when I walk out and I can feel something's off, but I don't know what it is. Uh, there are other times when I'm so in my own world, I'm not paying attention, I'm clueless. But... Um, but there's definitely times where you feel something's off and you're not sure what it is. And I think that's what you're speaking to when there's something off in my leadership and the way I'm relating to it. And I don't know how to address it. Is that it? Well, there's that. It's not only one doesn't know how to address it, but one isn't really sure even how to think about it. You have that feeling that something, something is not right in the culture or in the behavior or in the reaction to what you had. It's that feeling you, you, know, you have like you walk into a room and everybody stops talking. You know, you feel that there's some dynamic there and you're part of it. It's, sometimes, it's about you or your behavior or your leadership, but it's very hard to find a framework for understanding it. Uh, and that's kind of what my book is about. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a fable, but it's based on the experiences of my clients and the protagonist in the book is somebody who has stepped up to or has been promoted to a much higher level of leadership. And he finds that the very skills that made him successful in his previous position, 
they're not working now. They're not working at this newer position because things are different. He has people who are specialists in, in things. They know much more about their specialty than he does. They've been there a lot longer. They, they're stronger personalities. They feel they know the company better. And his leadership is not having any leverage. And, and then he gets a warning about it that, that his leadership is not working. And he has no idea where to turn to because, because he's only doing the things that got him to the promotion in the first place. But then he becomes acquainted with a conductor. And he starts sitting in on the conductor's rehearsals and then having uh, conversations with the conductor about why he rehearsed this way. Why did, why did he do things that seemed completely counterintuitive to the executive? Like at one point he tells the orchestra, don't watch me here. Don't watch me. And he's saying, well, why didn't you ask them to watch you? And, uh, and the conductor explains this kind of framework he has of leadership, which is much more empowering uh, is much more um, helping people to around their blind spots and and building a culture of collaboration and the tools of collaboration and then elevating the leadership up to a higher level so that so that the workforce is taking care of the things that they can take care of and the leader is then taking to, them to places that they couldn't go without the leader Whereas the default behavior for leaders is often that you get involved in the things that they don't need you for. And you're, giving, you're telling them directions about things that they already know. And that erodes the effectiveness of both your leadership and the way the workforce works. It distracts them from what they could be doing. Well, let me underscore a couple of things there that I think are really relevant. So as coaches, we encounter this all the time that leaders uh, arrive at their position for any number of different circumstances. And, and then if they engage a coach, they engage the coach to work with them and the team. In our world, we're working with the teams, uh, not just the leader themselves. And there's a considerable um, uncoachability of an awful lot of human beings, maybe all of us at one point or another, where we're like, wait a minute, I got this business to this place. I have these inherent skills. I know what I'm doing. You don't know what the hell you're doing. You don't even know my industry. You don't know my business. You don't my, you know, and and none of that actually matters because that, and we've heard this uh, right before, is what got you here won't get you there. That all of the things that you got you to this first point aren't going to have you level up um, into the next place or even the next challenge at hand. And there's something that has to shift. Um, and it often comes from one of these blind spots that you talk about, right? Yeah, well, yes, of course. And, and then also because leadership is – very counterintuitive um, that you would think that by uh, by giving people feedback, by telling them the right things to do, and by supervising them closely and giving them all right messages, that that would add value. But sometimes that completely destroys the value. It destroys the relationship. It destroys the initiative. Uh, and the energy that your people have and the inspiration that they might have about the work. And you think, well, this isn't fair. I'm just telling them good stuff. But that's not the way leadership works. And so I, I got really fascinated in this, in this phenomenon. What is it that makes some people so capable of drawing the best results from other people? And, you know, certain people – they speak and the room is silent and attentive and other people, they speak maybe even the same words and, and the room is restless and people aren't paying attention. What is that? And so that, that's, what, that's what all of my work explores. So uh, m maybe one of the other examples, the elder care, the high tech or something like that would help to uh, bring that to life. Well, sure. Um, uh, I, some of my clients were like elder care, elder care franchises. And those people are in a tough industry. You know, caring for the elderly, it's not a pretty thing. And the kinds of, the kinds of people who end up giving the care are, are frequently, you know, people who are not, they're not executives. 
they're 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 not they're you know come from a, a, a part of our culture where where kindness and and where uh, you know training as as like nurses you know is very important and the caregivers I'm mean, not the caregivers but the people who are running the business they know that they're running a business and they're frequently looking at numbers and they're looking at at figures and they the, and they tend to lose sight of of how it is to to enable these caregivers to do their best and so uh they tend to they tend to not even understand that they are uh that their behavior is broadcasting a message that I don't really respect you and I don't really respect what you're doing and I don't trust you either. Mm. Uh, and those messages they're unconscious. The leaders don't even know that that they're sending them and they don't know how that erodes the the quality of the organization and ultimately the quality of the care. Now, some of the enlightened people who are looking at the industry, they understand these things and so they have meetings and try and get it across. And that was that was one function for which I was brought in. So, uh, there, uh, w- the thing that I'm left with a lot is that a lot of this is listening, and we talked about this as we were setting up for the show. That there's a kind of a listening that certainly the the conductor has, the audience has, the um, as well as the musicians, and that there's a there's a a you you say in the book title, leading by listening um, enhances the whole thing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, leading is that uh, listening is at the heart of it. And uh, a lot of people don't understand the power of listening, but that's one of the things that's really easy to demonstrate with the orchestra. Uh, And people are fascinated when they hear what the orchestra can do. There's in many sessions, there's one point at which I'm asking the orchestra to play without conductor. and, uh, And then I'm asking them to change it spontaneously and do it one way and do it another way. And then finally I ask them to do it with their eyes closed. Mm. Uh, and, and what they have to do is they have to all begin together. And, and there's nobody, there's no visual. And what they discover, I mean, what everybody hears is that the orchestra can do that. Their listening is so acute and it's so detailed and it's so empathetic that, um, that they're capable of doing that. And um, it's a real wake-up call for leaders when they see that this particular workforce can accomplish most of what it does without any conductor. And that raises the question, well, what is the conductor for if they can do all this stuff without a conductor? And then you begin to see that there is a place for the conductor in adding value and elevating the whole thing to a higher plane, bringing liberating a kind of inspiration which the workforce can't do by itself it needs a leader but it needs a leader who understands what that role really is that's why i say it's a it's a very counterintuitive role but there's a lot of wisdom about it and that's what i i convey in uh, in the sessions that i do and in the book too well i i hear in that the idea of uh, servant leadership. So there's a there's a certain kind of leadership that's based in authority, right? I I have I can fire you, I can hire you, uh, I'm in charge, I can fund or defund, I can punish, you know, and I have certain authority, and and that's uh, it's great, it's uh, somewhat Machiavellian, it's useful. Uh, but then there's another kind of leadership that influences and engages people, inspires them, calls them to do better work. Um, we we often think of that as inspirational leadership, but it it does. I also hear in what you're saying the servant leadership, where the leader is in service of the orchestra and of the piece of music, and they're listening for and coordinating the actions of the team of the of the orchestra to achieve something that on their own or left to their own, they might not achieve together. Yeah. There was one, one musician who, um, after I had modeled, uh, a conductor who basically micromanages the orchestra, um, I'm role-playing that and I'm conducting the orchestra that way. And then I handed the, the microphone to one of the musicians to react. 
And he said, there are many conductors who come to this podium and some of them treat us that way. And he said, when we have a conductor who does that, we will give him or her exactly what they're asking for and nothing more. (laughs) He said, but if we, if we have somebody who understands what we can do and creates the space where we can do it, he said, there is no limit to what we will give that conductor. Yeah. There's a whole other level. There's a, there's the, that richness. Um, that's really great. So, um, uh, leading by listening, bringing something, elevating something, uh, imagining your leadership from this thing, uh, from this other place. The book is Maestro, um, leading by listening. Um, Roger Nirenberg is the author. I want to, uh, if you want more info on the programs, the experience, if you want to uh, learn about the book, go to musicparadigm.com where you'll find all of that there. Roger, I want to thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun talking to you. Yeah. And I want to remind all of our listeners that we bring something interesting in the world of growing your business and the leadership required every week here um, on the Scaling Up Business podcast. And you'll find all of our episodes. You can subscribe if you want at scalingcoach.com. We also have free downloads of tools. You can get a copy of the book and so on. So worksheets and agendas and things like that that relate to and help you to get your business scaling up and get it and use all of that stuff. So lots of that stuff for free on our website at scalingcoach.com. Go there and find that uh, all of that that you need. Thanks again for listening. We'll talk to you all next week. I want to give special thanks to our original growth guru, Vern Harnish. Our show is produced by Shannon Amos with audio production by Podfly. Audio editing is done by Albert Burge, and our show notes are compiled by Ayn Codina with proofreading by Tim McGowan. If you got some value out of our show today, please share it with somebody else. Pass it along and let us know what parts you loved with an email to info at scalingcoach.com. Thanks again for listening. Keep scaling up. Keep scaling up.